Is this thing on? Don't worry, I'm gonna edit that out. Hey, what's up, bookworms and brethren? We are back today to talk a little Five Warrior Angels. It's going to begin with The Forgetting Moon by Mr. Brian Lee Durfee, Simon and Schuster, Shaga Press. Now, guys, this is a book that I have wanted to read for quite a while now. Brian is a sweetheart, and he actually sent me these nice signed copy way back when I was first getting my channel started. And I was like, okay, When's that third book come out? And he kept telling me, oh yeah, it's coming out this fall. And then as you know, the virus that shall not be named happened. He kept getting delayed. So I always said I wanted to kind of read these back to back to back so I could get the whole experience. And guys, I am almost embarrassed to say that it took me this long to read it because this was fantastic. And I'm going to talk about why. Now this was originally going to be a five book series, but just Brian decided to put the pedal to the metal and go ahead and do it in three. Now it's basically about five books in length because these are some big old boys, but uh, yeah, the first two books are out. That is Forgetting Moon and Blackest Heart. And then the Lonesome Crown book number three comes out in about three months time, guys. So there is plenty of time to catch up if you want to do that in time for that final book release. But I am very, very excited to talk about this, guys. We can't tell because it floored me. It floored me. I went into it with pretty high expectations, but I kind of had like mixed things from people that, you know, like to tell me if they think that I'll like it or not. Uh, a lot said that they thought I would like it. Some said, ah, I don't know if it's going to be for you. Uh, upon reading it, I'm like, I wonder if you guys have watched this channel because uh, I do love John Gwynn and I feel like this is very much in that same vein. But we're going to talk about all these things and more we're going to begin like usual guys are talking about what is this book about now a massive army on the brink of conquest looms large in a world where the prophecies are lies magic is believed in but never seen and hope is where you least expect to find it welcome to the five isles where war has come in the name of the invading army of sorcevia a merciless host driven by the prophetic fervor of the angel prince arrows toward the last unconquered kingdom of Golcana. Yet Galt, one of the elite knights archaic of Sorcevia, is growing disillusioned by the crusade he is a vanguard of, just as it embarks on his lord Eris's greatest triumph. While the eldest son of the fallen king of Gulcana now reigns in ever-increasing paranoid isolationism, his two sisters seek their own paths. Jean Jolin, the oldest sister, renowned for her beauty, only desires to prove her worth as a warrior while Tala, the younger sister, has uncovered a secret that may not only destroy her family, but the entire kingdom. All are led further into dangerous conspiracies within the court. And hidden at the edge of Golcana is Nail, the orphan taken by the enigmatic Shawcroft to the remote whaling village of Gallows Haven, a young man who may hold the link to the salvation of the entirety of the Five Isles. Guys, 2016, this is The Forgetting Moon. Now, with this book, guys, we're going to start with the good and what makes it good and bad because there's a lot of good to talk about. I got to say, first off, guys, the characters. If you notice that what is it about, it's a little longer than usual because this book does have a large, large cast. But here's the thing. Worry not, my friends. It is a cast that you will grow to either love to love or love to hate. Just about everybody in this, in this cast here. It's very, very large. But again, I think after a little bit of time in this world, you're going to start to click. You're going to start to differentiate the characters and you're going to start to really, really like what they do here. And even though this is a first book, he does really have some good character arcs for all of the characters. Now, there are seven POVs. Now, let's say there's four main and three kind of sub POVs because they're they're small. I don't want to call them supporting characters because they're important characters. But they, uh, as far as POVs go, they have a very, very small amount now. Nail, Galt, Tala, and John Jolin are going to be your main four POVs. We're going to get the bulk of the heavy lifting here. And then Ava, Sterling, and Lindhoff. I think Lindhoff only has like one chapter, honestly. But uh, yeah, they are going to have a... I think they're really kind of there to get the point of view from one of those other point of views, but from someone else that's right next to them is kind of how they do it there. And I think that's a great way of showing the unreliable narrator in some of these things. Because uh, much in a George R. R. Martin way, uh, I think that Brian is writing here in a way where everyone is kind of telling the story the way that they see it actually happening. Because, you know, in a story like this, there are no good guys. There are no bad guys. Nobody's doing anything wrong. Nothing there. No one is on the wrong side of history here. Everything is going to be just the way it should be. So I think that's great when he can actually show us one of those kind of smaller POV characters to show us 
uh, yeah, here's that character whose head you've been in this whole time. Here's what they're actually like. And I think that's why a character uh, getting uh, something from like Ava's point of view is rather important here. And uh, it's, it's, it's quite enjoyable the way that he does that. So I really do like the way he does that. I like the way the POV characters uh, interact with one another when they have those kind of you know, just, just opposite ends of the same kind of point of view. I think that uh, that plays off of each other really well. But like I said, guys, this is a huge cast and it is going to take a minute to get straight. I know a lot of people, when they first start reading a book like this, uh, pretty much any epic fantasy, uh, they're going to feel overwhelmed at first. You're going to feel like this is just way too many characters. I don't know who's who. Trust the process. It's going to get there, guys. I had it too. I had it when I started. I was like, these guys are all talking about some stuff. I have no idea what they're even talking about. But I knew. It's like, uh, think back to like Faith from the Fallen or Song of Ice and Fire when you started that. You felt like, oh my God, who are all these people and why should I care? He'll get you there. He will definitely get you there. I'd say probably about the one quarter mark, you are smooth sailing. You've, you've gotten everything kind of clicked in place. You know who's with who, who's allied to who, and you're going to get to know all the little backstory about these characters, how they end up where they are, and you're going to get to know more and more about their past. So I think that's a really, really great job and character work for a book like this to really have me feel like I know these characters in this first book of a trilogy is a great, great job by Brian. So don't freak out, like I said, about that big cast, but uh, they're not all morally gray either. I know that this is, uh, I would put this under the grim dark umbrella and there are characters that I think that are grayish and they do, they do make some mistakes and things, you know, that like real people would actually do. And I think that that kind of does dictate it as somewhat of a, a gray character, but I feel like you do know who are the characters you should be rooting for and who are the characters that are the bad guys. I think you do really know that. However, I do think in a George R. R. Martin kind of way, Brian's going to do that thing where, ha, huh, maybe you didn't know everything you thought you did. And you might have a different opinion about some characters uh, by the end of this book than you do, you know, the first few chapters. So uh, I think that's a great, great way to write some of these characters. And, you know, it, it's not just, okay, these characters are all just, you know, pieces of garbage. How could you ever root for anyone? Like a lot of Grimdark kind of falls into now in modern times. But uh, no, I think he, he does enough here where you feel like, okay, I want to root for some of these characters and I love to hate that person and things like that. You really do get some nice, nice development on those things. And uh, like I said, your opinions are going to evolve quite a bit. But uh, I like that he also will turn some tropes on his head. Now, it's uh, epic fantasy, guys. There's going to be some things where you're like, uh, this is nothing new. I've heard this in fantasy before. But I think that Brian does it in a way that, uh, you know, you think you know where it's going. He's going to take a sharp left and it will subvert things, but never in a way that insults your intelligence. It's never trying too hard. It's stuff just like, Ah, I didn't see that coming. That's really good. I, I really like the way that he did that there. But he also doesn't shy away from fantasy tropes. I mean, it's one of those things, guys, where I've always said, I know people treat the T word like it's just a bad word in fantasy. Uh, it's what brought me to this genre in the first place, so I don't mind some of those things. But uh, some things you might say feel familiar, but nothing ever feels recycled. It all really feels fresh here, and I think that's really, really impressive. He's able to do that in a, a, a debut book. I like the way that he presents that history is not actually like, a lie per se, but it's maybe it's been misunderstood, misinterpreted quite a bit over the years. It might have been like romanticized a bit. Uh, some things, you know, the the prophecies. Uh, there's lots of prophecies and, and a magical item hunt and things like that in here that I just love. But you get to know more and more about those things, and you start to say, oh, well, this isn't quite what I thought it was going to be at all. So you are surprised, but you know what? The characters are surprised, and there's a lot of things because there is a lot of fanaticism in here. There are some zealots in here, uh, and that leads me to the religion. I think the religion in here is probably the best I've seen since Song of Ice and Fire and in-world in religion about how it kind of plays and how there are different, like almost like warring factions over it. So uh, I really love what he set up there. You start getting really obsessed about these different books, uh, these tomes, uh, and in the books of Lejean, all that stuff. You really start to get really, really interested in that stuff as you go along. And I think he's just, he's built it really well. And you'll see some things that, uh, you know, many people have went their whole life or, you know, their generations of their family believing might get turned on their head sometime in here. And that's just, uh, it's really, really fun thing to, to kind of play around with. But uh, this is adult fantasy, guys. It is very, very grim. Uh, the characters can be detestable at times. Uh, but, you know, I, I, like I said, I feel like they're real people. They react like real people. You know, they never say anything. The dialogue's really good. Brian's writing, his style is very, very good. His prose is great. Uh, I, I feel like his dialogue never once feels like no human being would actually say that. Uh, so I feel like it's, it's very good. Stays in world. It never gets like where it's like, that feels way too modern. So that's uh, something I've, some things I've seen with some modern adult fantasy is they say things like, that feels 
otherworldly. That doesn't feel like something they would say in this world. Everything feels like it belongs here. And I like the way that he's doing that with his dialogue, with his characters. And uh, uh, like I said, it is grimdark, guys. There is going to be some, some violence and stuff. So yeah, you've been warned there. But I, I love this world. I think this is the first world since Faithful and the Fallen. Because, okay, full disclosure, guys. I love to have maps in the front of my fantasy books. I mean, that's just one of the things we love about fantasy, right? But I never look at them. I hardly ever look at them. I look at them, obviously, when I'm doing with Westeros, when I'm doing Middle Earth. I did it when the Faithful and the Fallen just because there were so many characters that were in different locations, and I was trying to see how far apart they were. This one got me studying the map quite a bit because, you know, we're doing, like, these these sieges and stuff, and then we're kind of going up north, and we're doing this. Like, how are they going to do that? they got to go through this mountain. I was really studying the map. It's a gorgeous map that is in this book, so uh, well done there. But, uh, yeah, you never really... Once you get the idea of where these things, where these lands are, you, you never really feel lost. You go exactly, okay, they're talking about the valley. I know exactly where they're from. They're talking about Sorsevi. I know where they are. So I, it's, it's really well done the way the map and the way he lays all that out. He really does make it clear for you to where it might seem overwhelming at first, but uh, yeah, you will get it. And I think that this world is just crafted really, really well. And I just love learning more and more about the motivations of these nations and why they are doing what they're doing. It isn't because they're evil. They actually, everyone has a reason. The other ones aren't just like kind of sitting back and chilling because they're lazy. Everyone has reasons and motivations for why they're doing what they're doing. And getting to learn that is half of the fun of this book. So uh, yeah, uh, lots of good things. That's not a perfect book, obviously. There never really is. These weren't necessarily what I would call bad things. These might be some things that might not work for you. So I do want to kind of bring them to your to your attention. Huge cast, like I said, and world. Uh, there's a lot of word salad at the beginning that you're not going to understand. Just let it go in one ear and out the other. And maybe uh, after you finish the book, maybe go back and read those first you know, two or three chapters again. A lot of that stuff will make more sense. But at first, don't be scared off by it. But it is going to be kind of tough at first. I always say, guys, have do, have no shame whatsoever in starting a nice little Excel spreadsheet or a nice notepad on your phone or something just to kind of keep some of the characters straight at first. There's no shame in that. I've never had any shame in doing that. I think it's great because once you actually, I feel like once you write it down, you got it. You really start to get it. So, uh, But he also has a dramatist in the back of the book, but I kind of warn you not to do that because it does spoil a couple things. Uh, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Uh, just if you want to know, know about who is related to who kind of things, there are some things like that. There is some bad language in here if that's something that does bother you uh not in like a joe abercrombie way not a jay Kristoff way he's never going to make you blush with him there are a couple it's not even as much as like in song of ice and fire but it is more than like uh, the comparison i make mostly with the series is faithful in the fall and there is more than that or if you've only read like brandon sanderson or something yeah the, the language and the violence is probably gonna like whoa for you so uh you know just a, a, a little trigger warning there for you it is very it is adult fantasy so there is going to be lots of things. There is going to be sexual assault. There is going to be violence. All those things that do happen in war during these kind of time periods are here and prevalent. So uh, you might want to watch out for that. And uh, some might consider the story a little bit too long, plus leave some unanswered questions. Now, for me, I call those hooks. Now, if this was the end of the series and I had those unanswered questions, I would definitely call that a bad thing. For me, I'm like... No, that's just mysteries that have yet to be revealed. You know, it's part one of three. But uh, here's the thing is a lot of people look at these books and they get spooked. And they say, that's just huge. That's way too big. It ain't no bigger than Brandon Sanderson books that you guys carry on about. Uh, I never once felt a slog in these books at all, guys. I think there is no wasted pages. I don't feel like there's any filler. Anytime you might, some people might feel like it's filler. To me, it's like, that's building character. You're really getting to know some little idiosyncrasies about some of these characters in a Stephen King kind of way. And I know Brian's a big Stephen King fan, so it makes a lot of sense. So, uh, yeah, I, I think that those chapters are important. But I can see how some people might not dig that. But why would you dig it? Let's talk about why I think you should read it, guys. Uh, fans of John Gwynn, like I said, specifically The Faithful and the Fallen. You're going to love this. This does feel like if... You had Joe Abercrombie here, and you had John Gwynn here. I feel like this is right here. It feels like Faithful in the Fallen, just a bit more violence, some more bad language. And look, I know everybody wants to pretend that uh, that John Gwynn's kind of PG-13. He had heads flying off nonstop in that series. But I think Brian's going to zoom in on the head and tell you about what's coming out of the head a little bit more. Again, like I said, not as much as like Joe would do, but he's definitely doing it more than John Gwynn does. But I definitely think people who loved Faithful in the Fallen, a lot of things about that. Like I said, the magical treasure scavenger hunt, you know, for the magical items, things like that. Uh, the, the war bands, the, the different characters, the warring nations, the traveling band, all that stuff. I think you're going to 
out, find a lot of stuff you like in, in the series that is very, very comparable to that series. So, I mean, Faith of the Fallen, I put it on one of my top 10 fantasy series of all time. So, if I am putting this book up there with that, you know how I feel about this. It's very, very good. It's just well-written adult fantasy, and it does not shy away, like I said, from those fantasy tropes. But it's very unpredictable. So, don't ever think that, oh, this is, I'm just going to know, I'm going to be calling everything 10 pages before it happens. I doubt it. I doubt it. Now, I've said I am very much an along for the ride kind of reader, so I can let some of those things get by me, and you might not. But for me, I'm like, there's so many things in here that had so many turns. I was like, wow, I didn't expect that to happen, or I bet this is going to happen. Oh no, it didn't. Uh, so I just said, you know, I think of that that uh, that that gift they use in my Discord of, of Brian looking at the book and laughing. I, I think that's what he's doing when he's uh when he's looking at our tears with some of the things here because uh. Uh, let's just say that uh, the cast is big for a reason, guys. That means that we have some things that we can kind of, you know, wash our hands of after a while. But yeah, just a uh, gritty, realistic, medieval fantasy with prophecies and numerous, numerous cultures. That stuff that you're into, guys, I think you're going to be very, very happy with what you find here. For me, guys, and final thoughts, uh, I went to this, like I said, not sure what to expect. I kind of heard some mixed things from people, not necessarily about the book, but about how they thought that I would feel about it. Uh, I got to give credit to uh, Madison Goodyear, uh, Scott the Bald Booktuber. They both have been railing for me to read this series for about a year plus now. And uh, they both said, you know, I think you're going to like it. They also made the Faithful and the Fallen comparison. So I want to give them credit. Madison was the first person I know that reviewed this on BookTube. So I definitely want to give her uh, some props there. So she was actually ahead of me on this one. But uh, she is the one who really was telling me, quit waiting. You need to read it now. I think you're going to 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 love it. But uh, guys, this has hit every single thing that I love about epic fantasy. Everything. It had action, adventure, tension, mystery, intrigue, politics, betrayal. It built the lore. It had the magical item treasure hunt that I never can get enough of, guys. It had all these things I loved about it. Really, guys, I feel like if Faith on the Fallen and Warlord Chronicles by Bernard Cornwell had a baby, this would be it. So if you like those two series, I don't see any way you're not going to enjoy this unless you just don't want sex and violence and stuff like that in bad language. I mean, that would be the only thing I could think that's going to detract you from it. So like I said, if the only thing you've read is Brandon Sanderson, this might be a little bit of a shock to you. But if you've read something like A Song of Ice and Fire, like A Faith on the Fallen, like A First Law, I think you're going to be very, very happy with what you find here. And I am excited, guys, because next month we're starting The Blackest Heart. It was really tough for me not to pick up Blackest Heart with the way this book ends. Uh, I wanted to pick up Blackest Heart immediately, but we are doing a read-along on the Discord. And you know what? Uh, since we're taking October off for spooky season, you guys want to catch up before Lonesome Crown comes out in November. There's plenty of time to do that on the Discord if you want to join us. I plan on starting The Blackest Heart uh, probably middle of September, right when I finish Fairy Tale. The new Stephen King book that comes out on the 6th is when I'll be starting The Blackest Heart. But I can't wait to talk about it. Uh, I, I'm sorry. I can't wait to start it and talk about Fairy Tale, obviously. But uh, I, I want to actually talk to Brian after I'm done with the series. I think that talking with Brian on the channel, having a nice spoiler discussion after the series is over would be something I think that would be a lot of fun. But uh, yeah, again, guys, I'm just flat out embarrassed. It took me this long to read it because this is easily one of my favorite reads of the year. And I'm very, very excited to continue. And I hope that you guys will give it a shot. I'll drop the links down below if you guys want to pick it up. I think that you are going to love it. I don't audio, but I know that Tim Gerard Reynolds is the guy who does the audio for this and everyone on the Discord said it's amazing. So if you're into the audio, check that out. I'll drop that link down below too. So guys, for the Forgetting Moon or the or in the Blackest Heart, Five Warrior Angels overall, have you read it? What did you think? Why don't you drop in the comments and let me know. No spoilers for Blackest Heart, please, because I haven't started it yet. But let me know, guys, what you thought about the Forgetting Moon or if you're willing to give it a chance and you need me to sell you a little bit more. I think I would love to do that down below. So hit me down there, guys, and I will talk to you there.